Welcome to Northwest Profiles, a look at people, places, and events of interest in the Inland Northwest. The traditional sights and sounds, arts and crafts, customs and religion of a fascinating Russian culture, neatly preserved not where you might expect in the motherland, but rather thousands of miles removed in, of all places, the westernmost province of Canada, more specifically in the beautiful Kootenai region of British Columbia and the friendly city of Castlegar. Why Castlegar? Well, to answer that question, you have to go back to turn-of-the-century Russia and retrace the story of a pacifist group of Russian people known as the Dukobors. They were a group of people that came from different areas in Russia, but it was their religious faith that brought them together as a group. They refused to serve in the Russian army, basing their belief on the commandment, thou shalt not kill, and they also refused to attend the Russian Orthodox Church. In the church, they had to bow before icons. Dukobors refused, and they based their belief on the commandment, thou shalt not make or bow to any graven image. When they refused to attend the church, the archbishop named them Dukobors. It means spirit wrestler. He said, you are wrestling against the Holy Spirit of the church, and that's how our people received their name. The development of the moral and ethical aspects of the Dukobor way of life in Russia would reach a defining moment in 1895 when they would burn all of their arms and weapons. It was a symbolic act that would mark the Dukobor's total renunciation of the taking of life. Unfortunately, this courageous stand against war, along with the Dukobor's rejection of the Russian Orthodox Church, would lead to ruthless oppression at the hands of both the Russian Tsarist government as well as the Church. Throughout the late 1800s, many Dukobors were either tortured and killed or exiled to Siberian labor camps. Finally, in 1899, following humanitarian efforts that focused worldwide attention on the Dukobors' plight, the Russian government relented and allowed the Dukobors to seek another homeland. With permission granted by Canada's Queen Victoria and money raised by popular Russian author Leo Tolstoy, seven and a half thousand Russian Dukobors migrated to the Canadian province of Saskatchewan. In Saskatchewan, they received homesteads in various places and they built villages exactly like the ones that they left behind in Russia. And those villages consisted of rows of individual houses, but they farmed communally. In 1906, there was an election, and the new minister who was elected, he insisted that the Duke of Wars register their homesteads, and with the registration, they had to swear the oath of allegiance. And that was against the Duke of Wars religious beliefs. When they refused to swear the oath, they lost their homesteads, which was about 200,000 acres of land. 2,000 Dukobors remained in Saskatchewan, and 5,000 moved to British Columbia in 1908. And this time, they bought land here in Castlegar and Grand Forks and built 90 communal villages. The villages consisted of two large houses and a U-shaped annex and behind the village, they had a two-story barn, a blacksmith shop, a sauna, 60 people or 12 families lived in a village. It was a complete communal way of living. People ate together, they worked together, and the Dukobors had several factories in the area as the source of income for the 90 villages in BC. They had six sawmills, two brick factories, and a world-famous jam factory here in Castlegar. This was all under the leadership of Peter Verrigan. He was called Peter Verrigan the Lordly. In 1924, he was assassinated. Three years later, his son became the Duke of War's spiritual leader. He was called Peter Verrigan the Cleanser. He died in 1939. Shortly before his death, during the Depression years, the sale from the Duke of War factories fell drastically like for other people, but they were owing a mortgage company $300,000. There was just no way they could raise enough money to pay off the loan. And in 1938, the mortgage companies foreclosed on all the Dukobor properties, and this caused a breakup of communal living in 1938. 
With the involuntary end of one of the most successful communal enterprises ever attained in North America, the Dukabor community suddenly found itself having to adapt to Canadian life outside the communal setting. For many, the transition was extremely difficult, considering the language and cultural barriers confronting them. Yet, for the most part, the Dukabor community did adapt, and over the last half century has managed to assimilate into the Canadian culture, while at the same time sustaining their own cultural identity. Today, Dukabors are in different walks of life, as doctors, lawyers, nurses, we still have uh, prayer halls in this area. We gather for prayer services. Dukabors participate in peace walks. Dukabors are still pacifists. And uh, basically, that's the influence we have here in Canada and British Columbia. It's clear the ideals of pacifism and the communal way of life, introduced to the Canadian culture by the Dukabors, have left an indelible imprint on the nation, especially in those areas where the Dukabors first settled including the Kootenai region surrounding the city of Castlegar, where a tribute to the Dukabor culture was built in 1971. Our Dukabor village, it's a full-size replica of a Dukabor village. We have the annex, the barn, the blacksmith shop, and sauna for display. And we have the two large houses. One is set up in the uh, traditional way, a kitchen, a dining room, a prayer room. We have eight rooms upstairs set up in different displays where they'll see beautiful examples of Dukabor handmade clothing, furniture. The next house is an art gallery. We have old photographs in there, some of them dating back to 1899 when the Dukabors moved to Canada. Besides a variety of static displays, the historical village also features some live demonstrations, highlighting some of the traditional Dukabor crafts. One of the more popular demonstrations involves the craft of ladle making, by 83-year-old Dukabor, Peter Oglo. Always eager to show off the craft he learned from his father, Peter is also willing to provide some personal insight into what it was like growing up within a communal village. For us, it was pleasure to live in a communal because you got your friends living right close by. And in the morning, if you will go, we we'll go together, either prune the orchard or gather the branches or whatever it is. And uh, all the work was designated as, as a work, but you could do it as a pleasure, as a play. You know, who could finish the row first and all this. And I really enjoy growing up in a uh, communal way. As it was in the beginning, when the Dukobor Historical Village was first built in the early 70s, it remains today a fine tribute to the Dukobor culture, as well as a tangible reminder of what they continue to stand for. It's a reminder of peaceful, most uh, peaceful life, and that's what it reminds, how, how people could live together without fighting, you know. This, the, the, this is very, very important in, in the, our days right now, because everybody is fighting for something or the other, you know. If you have a topic for Northwest Profiles, send it to KSPS-TV, 3911 South Regal, Spokane, Washington, 99223. Northwest Profiles is a presentation of KSPS Public Television.